one. Very well. Up you are. Yeah. Uh, you know, today here in Western New York, we have this slushy, gross snow, the worst kind of snow, not light and oh, fluffy, super heavy, very, very thick. You know, walk, you know, when you walk through it, it squishes, squish, squish, squish. If you Messy. aren't, if you're not familiar with snow, it is the worst kind of snow. And here we have these plow guys and a uh, plow guy did a really terrible job. So I had to get, my daughter calls it, uh, when I'm being a Ken, apparently not a Karen. Right. So I had to text a uh, plow guy and say, listen, plow guy, you got to get back here because you did a really, you know, this is not a bang up job whatsoever. Do you have a word for this type of snow? Slush. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's not, not, like, you know, I don't know if it's true or not, but you hear always that Eskimos have 4,000 words for snow or however many words. I, I just got, you know, a few. So it's slush and it's gross and it's wet. And uh, if you are somebody who has children and they have crocs, those crocs are going to be leaking with plenty of water. Let me tell you. So it's that so kind your, of stuff. Your daughter calls the counterpart to Karen a Ken. Yes, she likes it when I. This is bad news. This is Uh, really terrible news. I uh, thought I thought I was safe because I thought the (laughs) counterpart was a Chad. No, no, no. Just uh, finding uh, out the counterpart is a Ken. This is uh, I have to go on a campaign or something. We gotta we've gotta find the right meme because a Chad is somebody who is like the ultimate, the penultimate of whatever they're doing. So, and then there's the Giga Chad. And if you haven't looked up the Giga Chad, you should look up the Giga Chad because that's quite an entertaining uh, image. It's a sense of security. Yeah. So I'm sorry to relay it to you, Ken, (laughs) but that is what she calls it. I don't know if it's a thing or not. It could be just, you know, 12 year old girl. So, and I felt so bad for all the Karens and here it is on my doorstep. (laughs) It's on my doorstep. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm sorry to give you that news on other (sighs) news. I'll be all right. Today on ZDTV, what are we going to do? We're going to do the normal. We're going to look at the release notes from 0.27, which came out this week. And then we have uh, what I have called practical open ZD because we have uh, one of our solution architects, Nick Fregali, with us. And he's going to be showing us how he has used open ZD in his own home lab, which is exciting. I've seen little snippets of it here and there. I know that he takes things uh, quite far and does lots of neat things. And we'll, we'll just check out some real self hoster, practical open ZD stuff, which is exciting. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the release notes for 0.27. The CLI has been cleaned up and unused or unusable or underused components have been removed or hidden. That is a welcome change. Uh, When you type just ZD on the CLI, you get a whole bunch of stuff. And um, there's a bunch of stuff that, you know, didn't make sense in today's day and age that made sense four years ago when we were using it. So sure. growing pains, you know, we, uh, we went through them, we've taken some actions and fixed them up. So that's what that's all about. Also, um, now the ZD controller and ZD router, which used to be sub commands look right here are now embedded into the ZD CLI. I'm actually kind of excited about that. I know through the years we started with one binary, we made many binaries, and now we're coming back again. Everything goes in a circle, right? So we'll probably have more binary. We'll have, we'll have n binaries again in three years. But um, this is nice because now you'll be able to run ZD controller or ZD router from a single binary. So that's neat. That definitely has a convenience factor. Yeah, for sure. Um, the ASCII art, which if you have never run before is now an Easter egg. If you can discover it, I like that idea. Um, ZD tunnel was also uh, hidden. It still exists. It's just not displayed as uh, being available. I'm all for that as well. Um, Log format, unwrap commands have been moved under a new ops command. Uh, Executable download manage has been deprecated. Yeah. Demo and tutorial commands have been moved under learn. Okay. It's really uh, a lot more than housekeeping. We're not just tucking away things that are unused or removing them. There's This is a reorganization and a consolidation. Well, I mean, you know, if you're going to get a new refrigerator, Ken, you probably have to get rid of the old one, right? So, I mean. I can tell you that's true. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> so, you know, you got to do a little housekeeping when you're uh, when you're rearranging the house. Like, 
for example, when I move the couch, no, no lack of treasure is underneath there for me to go and clean up. <laughs> uh, what else do we do? We fix some bug fixes here. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. So that's what it is. Mostly bug fixes and that ZDCLI. Well, there's also the, uh, port check to the quick start, which is a nice handy little thing. So if your port is already occupied, you won't go through the whole rigmarole of trying to run the installer only for it to fail. All right. So let's get right into it. Let's bring Nick himself onto the screen. Here's Nick. Hello, Nick. Hi there. How is it going? Welcome to Open TV. Hey, thanks for having me. It's yeah, man. It's exciting. It's, it's yeah. definitely, yeah, it's lots of fun. Uh, Ken is nothing but giggles. We, we'll get a bunch out of him. Uh, so it's always, always entertaining. And uh, it's nice to have you on. And we're going to be taking a look at your home lab. I know you do uh, a whole bunch of stuff with OpenZD. So do you want to just uh, start off and take us on a tour and, and we'll see where, where it takes us? Yeah, sure thing. I uh, got a lot of electronics in my office, so I'll probably show you a few things here. But I, I, I'm going to be highlighting Home Assistant. And Home Assistant, if anybody has ever heard of it, is... Uh, it's it's one of the there's a couple of them out there open source um home control system smart home system and it's it's the cool wave of the future right so <laughs> smart everything <laughs> right well you think so right <laughs> so as, as the the website says and I'll, I'll i'll take you through a little tour of it um it it takes patience because it's not perfect there's a lot of components involved there's a lot of integrations involved. So you have to you have to be mindful and you have to <clears throat> convince your wife that everything is not going to explode in the home. Uh, so that way you can continue to develop it. And it, it provides a lot of um, useful things. In my opinion, it, it, um, it enhances our lives. It really does. It's worth my time to invest in it. And just so happens that what we do for work actually integrates pretty darn well with home assistant yep. and uh, enables me to do things that I guess the home assistant uh, normal packaging doesn't really have in it natively or easily done. Cool. So, so in a so, nutshell, home assistant is analogous to something else I might be familiar with or a replacement for something else I might know about. Well, okay. So it's, it's really hard to describe a smart ecosystem, but when it comes down to it, if, if you can think of Google, uh, their home automation system, and you can think of Alexa and that home automation system. It's a cloud-based SaaS, right? And it's designed such that you can purchase their little endpoints, their IoT devices, and one of them's behind me, uh, and be able to hook it into their cloud to do things to your home. So with my voice, I can activate certain things that are smart in my home that are also talking to their cloud. Now, I so picked up, you, say, you said those, you said that, that phrase twice now, their cloud, right? Ah, yeah, their cloud. And so, you are and so home assistant, down. and so home assistant is your cloud, right? Is that true? Or is this also in the cloud? Uh, good, good point. Um, so home assistant is a package that installs on a device and the home assistant itself is um, capable of communicating to cloud systems. So, Really, a cloud is somebody else's computer. So this happens to be open source software running on a Raspberry Pi in my basement. Oh, wow. It's so, so your home assistant is running on a Raspberry Pi in the basement. Yes, it is. That's I cool. actually have some pictures. I took some pictures right before have I, some pictures. I uh, started up here. Yes, I've got some pictures. Nice. Of course, I've got some pictures. So what okay, you're looking so at here... Your I, smart I, devices have to talk to that thing? Ah, okay. So... The world is growing up. There's more than just one smart device out there. In fact, um, most people don't even realize they've got smart devices in their home. So for instance, when we had our home built here, our thermostat is designed. And if you do put your Wi-Fi password in there, it will talk to their cloud hmm. and you can download their app. If you knew to do it, you read the manual, you can download their app and connect to their cloud in order to control your thermostat, which is like five feet away. That's, that's what life has gotten to be, right? The oh, remote nice. control you used to make your kids go to the TV and then you finally got a remote control. And then now you've got your phone, which can control the TV, which is two feet in front of you. I so. mean, you can't even control the TV anymore. You need the remote control. <laughs> the TV controls you. 
<laughs> that's that that's true. Um, so what you're looking at here, the Raspberry Pi that you see here, so you can see the circle there. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is running the Home Assistant software, and that Home Assistant software is right now it is private to my network. It's behind my firewall. Okay. It's connected to this particular router right here, which is sitting on top of. I've actually got okay. three routers, three different internet addresses. One here. One oh my here. goodness! Yeah, you have triplicate <laughs> route, uh, triplicate internet. Yes, three public IPs, none wow. of which are exposed any ports on the internet. And that's very important. neat. Very neat. Because that's that's the heart of of what OpenZD is designed to do is to remove your exposure to the internet, be able to give you better segmentation of your access and what things can access. And it's not just about people; it's about things right yep so now what, now what, are all your iot devices on one public or one uh, isp or are they natted together in some way so that you know how does how does that work out i'm interested or like if it was me i would be <laughs> i i am not very elegant when it comes to my home networking i would have my trusted devices on one you know private network and i would have my iot devices on another network you are so correct, Clint. Um, and one of the things I think that is a real disservice from the current networking industry, the, the consumer devices that are out there, is they don't really allow you to or make it clear how you can segment those devices, which are potentially dangerous to your life. Yeah. And they could, I mean, it, because these IoT devices, they're not just things that sit on a network. They have physical control. They have control over my physical world, sure. my lights, my, my garage door. Your These thermostat. things, which are my thermostat, <laughs> right? They cause my thermostat right. to go high or low when I'm on vacation. Look, one of them goes rogue. You don't want it meddling with the other ones. Another really good point, Ken. So these IoT devices, while we love them, they're smart. They're also stupid. They're not very cognizant of how they affect our lives beyond what their purpose is. And the manufacturers have no incentive right now in order to make them safe. So we have to make them safe as consumers. Mm -hmm. What happened? What the impetus behind me installing this home assistant was approximately about six months ago. Uh, you see this device right here? Yep. That's called an Insteon hub. And if anybody watching has ever, has ever installed an Insteon device, which is actually a really awesome uh, prevalent device in the IoT world for controlling switches, lights, garage doors, which I have a garage door opener. Uh, cameras. I have tons of cameras across my whole home. The Insteon company decided to go belly up approximately six oh. months ago. And the way that I was interfacing with this thing through my phone, my wife was using her iPad, was through their cloud system. Oh. It disappeared overnight. So guess what that left oh, me Oh, man. With? Nothing. Bunch of dead, dumb devices. Boy. Yeah. It's a home assistant so, as the Insteon, knew how to talk Insteon. You got it. So there's a Python package, which you don't, I'm going to mm -hmm. say for those who are, just want to get started and dabble with it, that you don't have to understand Python to, to make it work. But that little white box right there has an API interface. So originally the way it worked is that the api interface was used by their cloud system in order to control your local network it would reach out in heartbeat up to their cloud system waiting yeah. for you on your phone to tell it to turn the lights on where it would come back to your home and then turn the lights on and the way it does this is that it it connects to the internet through the cable in the back to the normal networking cable yeah but it uses the power line which goes right into my my breaker panel in order to control the light. So it actually sends a control oh, wow. message over the power line. No it's kidding. super reliable. Just like the good old Radio Shack X, I think it was X10 system did something yes. like that. So it's, it's yes. basically uh, using your copper wire to act, to, to activate something in your breaker. Yeah. So it, and it, it, it if you ever put a noise filter or, or a receiver on your power line to find out why is, why is my, you know, my device turning on and off. It could be your refrigerator sending noise across the line. Electricity mm. that can, you can transmit information over electric lines sure. that have normal just power. And so, so that's what it receiver does. receiver on the appliance side, right? Because the Insteon sends right. the signal through the copper to the receiver and then it has a switch. 
Well, that's pretty neat. So there, there's no zero trust there. <laughs> no, that's the other side. Everything on your side of the transformer, including right. your neighbors. That's right. Now, that's not an encrypted message. You can I tap bet. it. Well, you can have to tap into the power of your home, too. Sure. You got to be physically there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's cool. Mm -hmm. So the, the Wi-Fi, that, that white device then you said has an API. Uh, are you yep. exposing that API using CD? Yeah, well, what I'm actually doing, I've, I've done something a little unique here. So on this Raspberry oh. Pi runs Home Assistant OS, HAOS. HAOS, running on this SSD connected to this Raspberry Pi, has um, a, a Python package that it uses to communicate to Insteon. And so I've actually, to your point earlier, when you're saying, do you trust these things, you know, no, I don't. I fully do not trust any IoT device in my home. So that router right there is dedicated to only switching for and Wi-Fi for the IoT devices in my home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow my computer. Nothing on my normal network is reachable. It's an isolated network, which means nothing with an IP address on this router right here can talk to anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, this Insteon actually sits behind a small network that's connected through an extra ethernet right here. It's just a, that's, that's all of its extent of access. It can't reach the internet. It can't do anything except for broadcast. And this thing right here sees it. And this thing right here can talk to it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense so far. Yep. So I basically isolated this device. So it has no ability to get out to anything except for here. Right. All right. Now open ZD exists here. I've actually integrated it using the, um, so the next step is SDK, but right now I've got the tunnel model, the ZD Edge tunnel integrated into the operating system of this device, which oh, neat. Um, I had to build it myself. Yeah. How did you, yeah, how'd you go about doing that? So um, I used the, the build chain instructions that we have in the repo and I downloaded some I had to do a few modifications and I wrote a little scripty to do it. And potentially I'm going to upload it if it makes sense to, uh, to have others do this as well. I, I think I, I plan on doing that. So did you build um, your own OS, the own Raspberry Pi OS or Home Assistant OS or whatever it is there? The uh, HAOS? HAOS is built by Home Assistant themselves. So it's an open source package. This is it in the background right here. You can yep. go to Git and you can see all their integrations and everything. I didn't build that. I built ZDH Tunnel, our software to run in that environment. And so when you upgrade Home Assistant, do you have to redeploy the ZD Edge tunnel? No. Mm -mm. So, because so these where are all does containers. it works as a Docker container? That's what I was here. wondering. That's what I was wondering. Mm -hmm. So so um, the HAOS itself knows how to run Docker and you have used a Docker container containing the ZD Edge tunnel to provide access to your network, which has the home assistant stuff on it. You got is that it. Right. I see. You got it. Well, that's cool. Okay. How, how does, I'm interested to see how home assistant lets you run a Docker container like that. That's cool. Yeah. Well, they, they have this, it's a little bit of a modified Docker container. Um, they have the concept of uh, add ons. And so these add ons or integrations uh, basically is you can either have a localized add on, which you can make yourself. Or you can submit your add-on to their marketplaces. And this is how you would um, add on SSH daemon or add on other Me. services that might want to run on there. Like uh, if you wanted to run a Samsung uh, integration for your TVs to be able to turn on and off, then you can add that integration. It's a Docker container. Neat. Isolating it so that way the core OS is not affected by anything else that happens there. They're all isolated. Now, That's what I would say. So, uh... a networking container. As you know, Nick, uh, our buddy Jeff, he also has written a blog post on using OpenZD and Home Assistant. And he was actually asking this very question just the other day. Him and I were looking at how to install ZD into his Raspberry Pi. Same exact setup that you have, but we didn't discover add-ons yet. So you built your mm -hmm. own add-on. That's really neat. I'm going to show it to you. Yeah, I'm let's see. It. I'm sorry. Am I getting ahead of you? I don't know. That, that, no, no, <laughs> that's no, neat. That's, that's really cool. Uh, well, I, you should I totally think... open source that. Let's, <laughs> let's get that. You know, that, that definitely it. should be out there. You should let Jeff be your first guinea pig. 
So <laughs> as, soon, as soon as I, as soon as we all feel like it's in a place that, that looks good, then I can submit it to their marketplace. And quite literally, it becomes an add-on that gets updated throughout time as we push into the marketplace. It's really cool. Yeah, that's really neat. Super cool. All right, so one last point here is the fact that now that Instion is out of business, well, they got picked up by another company that I still don't trust. You see that little red light? That should be green. That red light indicates no internet access, and that's a good thing for me right. because I don't trust it. Now, if it had gone green, that means it's talking to the Instion SaaS, wherever yep. that is now. And this highlights a point because any SaaS solution you use, people, um, if that SaaS solution were to go down and they were to release their, their records, their DNS records back into the wild, then anybody can pick it up. Devices like this, which are hard programmed to talk to things that have a static DNS record, mm. could potentially talk to somebody malicious at that point. And then everybody's Instion devices now talk to a malicious server. Think about this. Oh it's God. scary. Yeah. That's right. why, uh, so the, 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 the whole cloud, the, the move to cloud and everybody having this easy access, that's certainly one that's nice, right? It's wonderful, but it does have that particular, uh, downside where, uh, in the future, should that, like you said, should that DNS go away and somebody else pick it up, they can do whatever they want with it because under the hood, really DNS just turns like translates a human name into an IP address and the computer doesn't oh care what IP address it connects to. Computers don't have feelings, not yet. <laughs> we don't know I that, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. All right. So now we know I've isolated at least this device. I've got cameras. I've got, like I said, my thermostat, other things that I simply, there are other things that can talk to other cloud systems. And still, ZD is a part of a balanced diet. It is good networking hygiene plus ZD that will get you into Nirvana. All right. Good networking hygiene means that you segment away physically on your network things that should not be able to talk to each other. And do then we you think take any dietitian technology like ours? <laughs> do we think any dietitians ever said that ZD is part of a balanced diet? <laughs> it's made I, with wheat. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. I don't know. Part of a complete breakfast. <laughs> breakfast ZD for breakfast, huh? Love it. I'm Italian. Um, okay. <laughs> so you're saying it's not out of the equation. Is that what you're saying? It's not out of the equation. No, <laughs> That's no, awesome. No. That's awesome. All right. So Home Assistant offers, they have applications that give you the ability to access that Raspberry Pi, which has an interface, a web interface in this case, from Android, iOS, Mac, Windows, Linux, whatever you, whatever flavor you have that you want to use to connect in. And normally this is how somebody like with a phone would be able to open their garage door, turn on the lights as they would talk into the home assistant. And here's the, here's the rub. Home assistant itself is not a SaaS solution. So what do you do? So they've created, they've created the home assistant people have teamed up with, or I don't know if maybe it's them as well. Nabucasa. Nabucasa is a SaaS or a cloud that, you can use right here. And I, I do I do have, allow this thing to connect into that Home Assistant cloud, the Abu Kassa cloud, so that way I can do some analysis on the traffic and what they're doing right there. But technically I don't. I usually turn this off, but I wanted to turn it on so that you could see. This is I what- I was gonna ask. So, so there, are some, there are some uh, features in the, in the cloud version that you find useful. And so you do turn it on once in a while or all the time or? Uh, every now and again, I'll turn it on just, just to experiment with it. But as I slowly, I, I, I'm taking those things that I need to be able to access off of their cloud. For instance, there is one thing that I can't get rid of. If I ever wanted to use my Alexa and, you know, to be able to turn on a light or uh, on or off, then that thing needs to be on. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Amazon doesn't have access to my home assistant. I don't allow that. The connection from the home assistant talks out to the home assistant cloud, which then bridges over to the Amazon cloud. And then mm -hmm. these things that I talk to with my voice can use that connection to turn my lights on. I see. So uh, does that mean that we need to 
teach Alexa a new skill, an, an open yes. city skill? Is that what we do? Yes. We can, we can relegate the need for any sort of home assistant cloud, making it easier for the home assistant people. I, I don't know if this is a profit bearing thing for them. I don't know, but um, ZD could with a skill in Alexa be able to do this. That'd be neat. Simply. It would be neat. And that's kind of my goal here is to remove the need for any SaaS solution that I don't control myself. Right. Right. And make yeah. it easy. I mean, in, in today's day and age when everything is a license and you, you know, you can, you can lose that license or SaaS. I, I very much uh, understand and appreciate the concept of having, you know, I own this. I should be able to use this. Yeah. And let me tell you, ownership of anything in our future world is going to be weird. If, if <laughs> anybody out there owns a Tesla, think about this. Uh, they're all internet connected, right? So you buy features that turn on and off. Even BMW's toying around with the idea of turning on heat yeah, seat heat heaters seats. for a yeah, price. That was, yeah, that we all heard this. Yeah. Ah, well, think about that. As, as soon as people you know, start to accept a little bit of it, they're, they're going to have to accept a lot of bit of it. And everything's going to be a, a rented solution. Yeah. Well, then we'll have BMW assistant. <laughs> <laughs> there are integrations here uh, that you can control your car, turn your, open your car. Oh, yeah, no kidding. Great. No how, kidding. How neat. Yeah, this is in here. All right. So the heart of what we I did here is on the add-ons. Let's click here. So this is their interface on my, my Mac. I'm Look looking at that. through the interface right now. And guess what I've got here? I've got Very a couple nice. different add-ons. One of those is SSH, DHCP. The reason I've got DHCP here is because I've got an interface that's hanging off on a pigtail from that Raspberry Pi going to my Insteon. That's how I give it an IP address and how I tell cool. it, you know, where on the network, it's a little stub network that it is. So so um, the home, home assistant is the default gateway for the um, Insteon? Yes. That's cool. That's right. But, I mean, it's a, a limited default gateway. It, it really doesn't. Yeah, it only goes one place. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. That's that's right. All right. So if I click on Z, so this is the integration that I. Well, if I, I can, Nick, I, I did happen to see DNS mask back there. Yeah. How does that and ZD play together? Do they play together perfectly, or was one did one need the other? So there is. I, I, that's actually. I think it should be. It's on right now. Um, but yeah, they play fine with each other because of the way the ordering of the uh, res resolution works I, I could go into it but this allows um the raspberry pi to be able to to resolve certain addresses that i, I have locally in my home and gotcha. then, well and and for everybody i mean i assume everybody understands why i'm asking this question but obviously a dns mask if you don't know is a dns server and ZD Edge Tunnel also provides DNS functionality for the intercepting of addresses. So I saw both in there and wondered if they would work together or if they fight yeah. each other or they if, they, if one needed the other, right? Like I, I didn't know what I, but I did happen to notice it. Anyway, yeah, I'll let you go back to the, the ZD Edge Tunnel <laughs> if you want. But you see this interface? I mean, it it's these, you, it might, feel like a Docker container because the way that it's it's presenting the information about this process running, right? It has its own RAM usage, add-on, CPU usage, and the host name. It is a Docker container. And I've just set them up in, in orders of resolution. We, maybe we can do that on another. <laughs> but if we if we look at NetFoundry ZD right here, uh, this is what we call our ZD Edge tunnel, right? And I compile it for this operating system so that way it'll run as a container in this operating system. And it's running. Here it is. Configure it. You give it an enrollment JWT so that way it becomes an identity. And it is an identity on my personal NetFoundry network, which I Very have a neat. Teams account. So, so you made a, so you, you use a Teams account. You made an, an endpoint in Cloud ZD parlance and then downloaded that. And you put it into this directory. Did, is that what you did yeah. there? That's right. And Ken, props to you, buddy. I, I used your your Docker uh, containers as a template for making this work. And perhaps we can make this uh, something that gets rolled out normally. And uh, yeah, so it looks for any new JWTs. It registers them if it comes online, sees they're not registered or enrolled, and then becomes an identity on the network. So on my team's network, my Raspberry Pi home assistant is an identity itself. 
this is fundamentally different than how Jeff has set it up because in Jeff's world, he has an edge router that is the identity in the network. Yep. The Raspberry Pi is just a device that that edge router can talk to. Yeah, but he's looking to go this way. This is like yeah. the next step. The next step for me is to integrate the SDK directly into the core. Yeah. Very cool. That would be sweet. But right, so this this actually reduces some of the attack surface internally on my network because no longer I, I don't have to allow any other device to talk into the Raspberry Pi, the home assistant anymore. The I mean, it's so neat because point. to me it's super neat um, because I, I could monitor my mother's house with this mm -hmm. from my house, mm -hmm. like like and have my own cloud that I'm running my own self. You know, like that's really I think this is really interesting. And it gets better. Yeah, it gets much better. It's it so, better. It gets better. Yeah, now that that is running there, I we totally need thing. to get that into the Home Assistant add-on category and then we can call it has as an i can has i can has access right the home assistant z I can has yes <laughs> you see that little button down the incredibly obvious button in the bottom right the add settings store oh that bottom right look at all these cool add-ons you can have there's tons there's grafana there's you can put an ftp on here you can do aircast sonos if you've got sonos i mean there's tons of stuff in here and then there's also a couple of uh, other ones nice. like this yeah. right here. Hey, zero tiers in there. Yeah. Wire guard, I caught two. Tail scales Wire in guard. there. Nice. Tail scales in there. Tours in here. See, we belong in there. We belong here. All those and the are, reason we belong here. All those add-ons are deployed as containers? Yes. And they're super easy to install. And they're super easy to keep up to date. Yep. We, we need to be in here. We absolutely should. <laughs> Cool. Absolutely. But here, we, we take these VPN type uh, configurations and app WAN them, right? We give them the ability to segment for services, which makes so much sense in this world. Because now I can say that the uh, Raspberry Pi there, the Home Assistant, is capable of reaching on the outbound. It itself is capable of pulling in video streams from the other router, which has another segment that's private for all my cameras where I have an edge router over there. So I can pull in my video streams into the Raspberry Pi for viewing on devices like this. That's really cool. Yeah, it really is. So um, here's the interface. And I'll show you the cameras right here. It's a nice and snowy day here. How does that video image come from my cameras? My cameras are on a completely segmented PoE network that has no access to the internet. It has an edge router over there. The Raspberry Pi that is the home assistant is pulling the video stream over NetFoundry using OpenZD, in this case, CloudZD, in order to pull from the edge router that particular camera or all these cameras right here to give me imagery that I'm seeing on my map. That's the Very way neat. I access my cameras. Nick, you should be going to conferences and talking about this. This is neat. <laughs> it really, it, it's, it's, I find it to be fine. I mean, there's so much you can do in here, and all of this can be enabled by ZD, honestly. Uh, That's I'm really cool. Just now, how, how many OpenZD services are there? How many services are declared? Like, do you make one per camera? Do, how, do you, uh, how do you set up the actual network? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I do it per camera, not per network, for the obvious reasons, I think, for me. Um, the reason it's obvious to me is because in our world, in ZD's world, we want to reduce the access, or we want to give access in layers, not least reduce privilege. the access. Least privilege. Which I like to call it giving somebody the layers to make the onion, not peeling off the layers of the onion. It's fundamentally different place you begin. And so in order for me to be able to say, I, my phone has accessed the Raspberry Pi, which then went to the edge router to get to that specific service. My wife did that. I have to be able to identify the service. If it's just a network access, then I can see somebody has hit the service, but it's the whole subnet that's allowed as one service. It doesn't give me as granular of a view of what or who has been accessing it. I like to set it up 
very specific. You get this port. Well, that's cool. So my camera is important because there's a control port and there's a video port. And I don't give anybody access to the control port except for my phone. <laughs> Nobody. No backup plan. Nobody. <laughs> and wow. It's seven degrees outside. So last thing I wanted to show here, um, which I think is super important to see, and I'll do a quick change over to my... So you can see my screen on my yep. phone. Awesome. Yep. All right. So you see there it says ZD Mobile Edge. That's mm -hmm. our ZD iOS app. When I click that guy, it's an identity on the network as well. In a few seconds here, it's going to ask me, hey, what do you want to open? Cool. Click on Home Assistant. The real link is my cameras. Safari, if I've got a a service like a web service that I run and matter most is our internal service, right? That we can talk to each other, but home assistance right here. Okay. Now I will just go ahead and turn on Z right there and I'll have it meander over to, Hey, look at that. So it brings every time I open, open ZD, uh, the ZD mobile desktop or the mobile edge, it presents me with a list of things that I should be able to access using it using That's my really identity cool. on that network or multiple networks. And one of those things is Home Assistant. So I can see here and now I can browse all the things that this Home Assistant has access to, including on my phone, my cameras. That's really neat. I think so. <laughs> it is, no, no doubt. And so each of those have services and do you end up running with uh, in in cloud ZD parlance, it's called an app WAN, but in open ZD, we would consider it to be a service policy. So do you have more than one app WAN or do you run, um, you know, one big one? How do you do that? Do you segregate right oh. down? Yeah, you, I, have, I have multiple app WANs for this, this reason. Um, so app WAN one might be for the administrator's phone, me. I have access to the control port of each one of these cameras mm -hmm. so i can actually do administrative tasks on them like add and users so you've used users. and so you've used an app WAN for that as opposed to um having some other kind of control like you, yeah. you found you found app WANs to make that easy you, do you use um it's, attributes then all of the place i exclusively use attributes because attributes give you flexibility for instance if i had to replace one of these cameras and it got a different IP on the network, these things aren't registered themselves with records, DNS records locally, then I can, with an attribute, simply just rehome to that camera's new IP address on the service. I don't have to mm -hmm. reassociate the at with the router that has access to it right. um, and that specific thing. So attributes make it super flexible for me to do changes without having to go and do a lot of them inside of the services or app plans themselves. And as a as a user slash administrator, have you found uh, using OpenZD with your non you people, meaning wife, mother, uncles, aunts, whatever, uh, has that been a pretty seamless experience, or is it, has there been friction there? Like, is there something we could do better? It's actually been pretty darn easy. Um, always room to improve to make things better. That's how we grow. However, with my wife who has no desire to learn anything about what I do on a daily basis. <laughs> and I don't blame her, right? It's not her world. Um, for those of us who live in this world, we love to develop and create things like this, but those who don't live in this world need it to be easy so they can move on with the things that are valuable in their lives. For her, this has been monumentally easy because like I showed you before, all I did was add her as an identity. I told her, go download this app, and I gave her an identity, which she just added on the app, right? Oh, right here, go add, add identity, yep. right? She added the identity and instantly because of the, the attributes that I associated with her identity, she got access just like I do right here to all the cameras, all right? This is an admin account, so I had more holistic access. But you can see the side yard A, porch, play cam, all this was instantly available to her 
as soon as she turns on the ZD application. And so she can see the cameras and she didn't have to do anything technical. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, for her, it was great. Yeah. So she, you know, <laughs> I bet it is for you too. You don't, you don't have to do too much then, right? Like things just work. <laughs> you have easy to remember uh, IPs or uh, DNS names, you know, host names to get at. Easy to install apps and sort of stuff. That's really cool. So, are there are there bridges for Home Assistant that are, um, work like a, that that allow you to use devices that were only designed for Google and Amazon, or do you have to shop for Home Assistant compatible devices like Insteon? They, they have to have some mechanism, usually through an add-on, to talk to those those things. Uh, I'll show you. Back on. Okay, so here, which there's tons, I'd be surprised if you didn't find, or if you had some obscure IoT device, maybe, but there are a lot of obscure ones in here. Uh, it has to have some form of mediation layer, uh, something to do the talking. And that's through an add-on like this. When you add something like, you can even add VLC right here, which gives you controls, but it has to be able to talk the language of the device. That makes sense. Like there's even Z-Wave in here. I think you had mentioned there's X10 is in here, I believe as well. That's still around. Wow. It's still <laughs> around. Well, still you know, around. if that device still works, you want to be able to access it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't see why it wouldn't still work. Yeah. I played with those when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you have, to, I... you have to have the add on. Yeah, this has been, I think this has been another great ZDTV. I've enjoyed it tremendously, Nick. Thank you for taking us on a tour. I think it's really, I think it's really, I like, I really love that there's an add-on that you made. I am all about getting into that store to make it easy for somebody like Jeff to just go in and uh, add oh, ZD Edge Tunnel into it. Like, I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. I, I, I'm glad that they have that capability too. That's really neat. It's right. what made their ecosystem really viable. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, that's I think that's going to be our ZDTV then. We're at 45 past the minutes. I think that is a, a good ZDTV. Ken, anything you want to add on top? I'm good. Thanks, guys. How about you, Nick? How was your ZDTV experience? Awesome. All right. I love awesome. it. Love it. All yeah, right. We'll, we'll, we'll be sure. Useful. Yeah, heck yeah. It was really cool. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe we'll have you back on the next time you do something else exciting. And until then, we'll see everybody later. See ya. <laughs>